Hi, and welcome to the American Society of Echo E3 lecture series. My name is Lucy Safi, and I am Director of Interventional Echocardiography at Hackensack University Medical Center and Chair of the ASC Emerging Echo Enthusiasts, also known as E3 Special Interest Group. This special interest group provides an opportunity for the early career physicians, sonographers, and trainees who are interested in echocardiography to present, interact, and discuss echocardiographic topics. Each lecture is formatted as a 30-minute didactic lecture followed by a panel discussion. On the panel will be two moderators and an expert in the field. During the discussion section, the panelists will also answer audience questions, so please enter your questions in the Q&A box below. This virtual lecture series will be recorded and later available online via the ASC E3 website. I would like to introduce my co-moderator today, Dr. Bhavana Arya. Dr. Arya is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Washington School of Medicine, Director of the Prenatal Diagnosis Program, and Director of Fetal Cardiology at the Seattle Children's Hospital. She completed her residency in Categorical Pediatric Cardiology Fellowship at the Combined Program at, Cle at Columbia and Cornell University Medical Centers in New York. She completed her Advanced Imaging Fellowship at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Dr. Arya, and thank you for being my co-moderator today. Our physician expert is Dr. David Sadak. Dr. Sadak is an Associate Professor of Pediatric Cardiology. He completed his pediatric residency in Memphis and fellowship in, the, in pediatric cardiology at the Cleveland Clinic. After fellowship, he completed an additional year of training in non-invasive imaging at the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin, where he has been practicing since. He serves as the Associate Medical Director of Clinical Operations and Director of Quality Improvement for the Herma Heart Institute, and is also a co-director of the Fetal Cardiology Program at the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin. Welcome, Dr. Sadek, and thank you for being our expert today. Our guest speaker is Dr. Sarah Crichton. Dr. Crichton is an assistant professor of pediatrics at the Children's Wisconsin and works as a pediatric cardiologist with subspecialty training in fetal cardiology. She received her medical degree and residency from the University of Illinois College of Medicine and Pediatric Cardiology Fellowship from the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin, Wisconsin. She is an active member of the ASC and the E3 Special Interest Group. Welcome, Sarah. You may share your slides. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lucy, so much for that introduction. Like she said, I'm Sarah Creighton. I'm a fetal cardiologist at Children's Wisconsin in the uh, Milwaukee area. Um, and work for the medical college as well. And I'm here to talk today about using echocardiography, uh, fetal echocardiography to analyze fetal arrhythmias. To start off, I have no disclosures. And then I wanna review some of our objectives today. So the, the main objective is really how do we assess uh, fetal arrhythmias um, using echocardiography? And then we'll talk about some basic understanding of the different fetal arrhythmias that we see in, as fetal cardiologists. We'll kind of break that down into irregular rhythms, bradyarrhythmias, and then tachyarrhythmias. So when we think about fetal arrhythmias, it's quite difficult to detect um, and identify these fetal arrhythmias in the prenatal period. And that's because fetal uh, ECGs or uh, electrocardiograms are not reliable and not easily recordable in the fetus as they are surrounded by amniotic fluid and um, that insulation makes it difficult along with mom, mom's rate, which is going at a different kind of speed. There are other modalities that we can use like fetal ultrasound and echocardiography and also fetal magnetocardiography. But today we're gonna focus on fetal ultrasound and fetal echocardiography to de detect and understand fetal arrhythmias. So when we talk about fetal, uh, using fetal echocardiography, there's a few things it can do and a few things it can't do. We talk about what fetal, uh, fetal echocardiography can do. It can give you a heart rate assessment. It can give you a rhythm assessment, whether it's regular or irregular. It can approximate the rhythm subtype using pulse Doppler, tissue Doppler imaging, and M mode. And then we can assess uh, fairly accurately for structural abnormalities. What it cannot do is give you an EKG or give you the exact diagnosis of the arrhythmia 
though pattern recognition can fairly reliably detect uh, some of these subtypes, as we'll kind of discuss later. So a lot of the data that uh, and um, analysis that I talk about is is based on an article, two articles. But the main one we'll talk about is this diagnosis and treatment of fetal arrhythmias. It's kind of in small print under this table that was published in, in 2014 by um, some fetal cardiologists, very prominent in fetal arrhythmias. And what they focus on is extracardiac imaging as well as intracardiac imaging and, and diagnosing and assessing the health of the baby with an arrhythmia. The extracardiac imaging focuses on signs of distress in the baby. We call that high drops, which can include uh, pleural, pericardial effusions, ascites, um, decreased fetal movement, abnormal Dopplers in the brain and outside the heart, um, amniotic fluid assessment and organ enlargement. Um, with pulse and color Doppler, we can look at the ductospinosis, which is a, a fetal structure that goes away after birth that connects the umbilical vein to the IVC and bypasses the portal venous system. We can look at middle cerebral artery, which is a, a and Doppler that um, to look for evidence of abnormal resistance, and look can look at the inferior vena cava, superior vena cava, and hepatic vein flow for evidence of abnormal Dopplers. From the intracardiac side. We will talk about many of these more in detail as I'm talking about fetal echo, um, but we can look for structural defects, qualitative um, abnormalities um, in wall thickness, cardiac function, um, look at the uh, foramen ovale and the tissue around that. We can look at um, intervals in pulse and color Doppler um, patterns there, as well as looking at M mode to um, identify atrial and ventricular contraction. Briefly, for those of you that are not extremely familiar with fetal echocardiography, it is a, it is a small field, but prenatal diagnosis of fetal cardiac abnormalities. Um, we do subspecialty training um, in that after our cardiology fellowships um, and use our echocardiogra uh, echocardiography uh, sonographers frequently to do our um, image capture. These are best performed uh, well, with a pregnant mom at 22 to 28 weeks gestation. Um, and we use several imaging planes to capture our, our 2D cine clips. Um, most of them are all cine clips. We do some, um, some stills, but typically our main plane is our axial plane, which you can see on the right. Um, we can also do a coronal plane on the baby um, where we're kind of cutting the heart from a anterior posterior, as well as a sagittal plane, which is more left to right. Um, all of these can give us different views of the heart, as well as the blood vessels that come in and out of the heart. Um, and, and can help us with structural abnormalities, but also help us find adequate places to do Doppler um, M-mode and pulse Doppler imaging. So when we look at this image here on our right, we can see um, our, our fetus. I think of it almost in, in terms of MRI. You have to think three-dimensionally when we're looking at a baby. Um, and we're cut in an axial plane here. What we can see, now that I threw some labels on, is that we have um, an axial plane with the spine and the posterior portion of the baby here. The anterior uh, portion of the baby, the front of the chest wall is here. We have our left side, and you're gonna have to trust me on this one because left and right can be very difficult to determine prenatally. Um, here, where our apex of our heart is. And then we have right down below, this bright structure is the rib. You have your lung tissue that is um, pretty heterogeneous here. And then you have your heart itself that sits very fairly central with the apex pointed to the left in this case. This is a structurally normal heart. So what we see is the most posterior structure is our left atrium. We have our right atrium. Oh, sorry, let me go back. Uh, right atrium here. Our right ventricle is typically the most anterior structure in this axial plane. And then you uh, here, and then you have your left ventricle here. Your AV valves are in this plane. Your atrial septum is in this plane and your left ventricle, your ventricular septum is here. You can slide superior and inferior on the baby to get into outflow tracts and other more detailed parts, which is beyond the scope of this talk, but at least you have a primer on kind of what planes we start to look for. Typically we use color Doppler M mode for most of our assessments. We can use tissue, tissue Doppler and actually even strain imaging on fetuses to get um, different functional and more spe specific assessments, but those aren't as well described. So breaking down then into basic rhythm assessment, we'll start with a heart rate assessment. 
This is typically best done by looking at Doppler to measure from one from the onset of one beat to the next, although M mode is utilized frequently as well. And the best images to acquire in kind of a simple way are the umbilical artery Doppler and umbilical with usually you'll see the umbilical vein as well. And we can see that on the right and I'll show you a little bit more closely, as well as looking at the outflow Dopplers. So here, when we're doing that Doppler assessment, we can see here, that's our image, our pulse Doppler is here. And this is our um, umbilical artery. You can see it's a continuous flow with a uh, prominent systolic, um, systolic. And then you have a little bit lighter. This is your umbilical vein. It's continuous, it's non-phasic flow. So when we assess our heart rates, what we can do is we can do peak to peak or onset to onset to measure. Um, and the calipers here kind of show you this would, uh, we measure this time interval and that can uh, help us assess what the heart rate is. In addition, you can look at out flow Dopplers, and this is actually in, in um, a, your aortic Doppler and your superior vena cava Doppler. We're almost in a sagittal, similar to a subcostal sagittal plane here. Your inferior vena cava is here. Your superior vena cava is here. Your aorta, ascending aorta is here. It's not as, this is an older image, probably 20 years old um, from uh, this paper here, but what you can see is that from the onset to onset of your uh, aortic outflow Dopplers, um, or you can do peak to peak, and again, you use that caliper and you can get time to assess what your heart rates are. The next part of the rhythm assessment that you can use is looking at uh, just different aspects of pulse Doppler. And I wanted to talk about uh, these inflow outflow or arterial venous Dopplers that we can utilize to assess rhythms um, as what we can see in, in what is your outflow, your arterial um, uh, rate that can uh, show you how fast the ventricle is moving. And then you can see how that works with a, a systemic venous or pulmonary venous Doppler to su suggest kind of what's going on in the atria. And so uh, there are three kind of different main areas that we look at. Um, they can suggest various arrhythmias. We do pulse Doppler with both inflow and outflow. So this is similar, this top pane is similar to our, uh, that last slide. It's the superior vena cava and aortic Doppler, it's more of a sagittal plane on the fetus um, where you kind of get your um, bicaval view with the aortic Doppler also coming out. If you can get your pulse, uh, you can see where your pulse is. It's kind of encapsulating both of those um, structures you get um, since they flow in opposite directions. The SBC is bringing blood back to the heart. So it is um, kind of under our baseline while the aorta is going away from the heart. So it's over our baseline. You can capture your venous inflow as well as your uh, your aortic outflow at the same time, and you can get your atrio, kind of your atrioventricular and ventricular arterial timing. Probably the most common one that fetal cardiologists use in terms of inflow outflow Dopplers is the mitral uh, inflow aortic outflow Doppler um, in structurally normal hearts. Um, this Doppler is easy to get from a four chamber axial plane. So here is posterior, anterior, left and right. And you can kind of see again, older image, with our pulse Doppler here um, below the mitral valve, just similar to what you would do in transthoracic, but you uh, favor a little bit more towards the septum so you can get your aortic outflow as similar to a five chamber view from the apicals. Um, and what you get is, uh, again, uh, they're moving in opposite directions. So you get your above the baseline is your mitral inflow with the two peaks um, and then your outflow, your aortic outflow here. Um, we'll look into this a little bit more on what other mechanical kind of measurements we can get from it. And then finally, I just like to mention the pulmonary vein and pulmonary artery Dopplers. Sometimes these are the hardest to get because pulmonary veins and pulmonary arteries don't have nearly as much blood flow prenatally as they do postnatally um, due to the presence of the ductus arteriosus. But what you can see here below the baseline is your pulmonary veins. Again, they run together, but in opposite directions. And so you have your pulmonary vein with that venous phasic flow. And then you have your pulmonary artery Doppler um, above the baseline, which is very high resistance. You can kind of see very sharp deceleration there due to the fact that the lungs are filled with fluid. And so the pulmonary arteries have very high pulmonary vascular resistance prenatally. When we look at pulse Doppler even closer, what we can do using those inflow and outflow Dopplers is to really measure a mechanical uh, PR interval. And if you remember um, looking at EKGs, your PR interval is really the onset of your P wave to the um, onset of the QRS uh, complex. And that measurement can really give you an idea of how, um, how long it takes for uh, the electrical signal to go through the atrioventricular node. We use it from a mechanical standpoint, since we don't have the electrical deflections that we can measure. And we use um, 
our mitral inflow, which again, you have your E wave here is a smaller wave, your A wave there. So the A wave corresponds to the atrial contraction of the heart. And so that would be essentially your P wave. So what we do is from the onset of atrial contraction to the onset of ventricular contraction with your, um, with your outflow Doppler, that time interval is what we call our mechanical uh, PR interval. So that timing can really help us diagnose things like heart block. Um, it can help us to assess maybe uh, different tachyarrhythmias, uh, depending on if we can see these two peaks. Um, but it is a very useful um, mechanical measurement that correlates fairly well to the PR interval after, um, after birth. Other, uh, I, we talked about M mode as well. Um, although we don't use M mode in transthoracic echo, um, in peds, pediatric cardiology nearly as much as we used to, we use it more often for rhythm assessment in fetuses. Um, here again, you get your picture before, and as you remember, you get um, the line that looks at the movement of, that, uh, of the speckles in that point in time. And what you, uh, you wanna make sure that you get through both the atria and ventricle to see kind of the timing of contraction in both, uh, between both. Um, it's a really nice way to do rapid assessment over time um, of the atrial and ventricular contractions. And the position, you position the cursor again, so that it goes across both. Here, our atria is here as well labeled with the A and our ventricle is here um, with the V. And so we're going through both. It does not have to go through the right atrium and right ventricle. Um, it can go through the right atrium and left ventricle as long as you're going through one structure and the other. Um, and so then you can see your atrial contraction here and how it correlates to a ventricular contraction a somewhat time later, right? You should see A and then a V, A and then a V, this one-to-one -one relationship. I'll just mention tissue Doppler. Um, it looks at the myocardial wall motion. It can identify the timing of atrial contraction um, as can be in, um, uh, in transthoracic echocardiography. It, not all machines are able, able to do this because um, you need simultaneous signals from both your atrial and ventricular walls. So it's not universally available, but you can kind of see it here that you can essentially do the same with your PR measurement. But it's not something I utilize regularly, but it is something that, that is out there. Okay, so moving on to fetal arrhythmias. So when you think of fetal arrhythmias, I guess you have to know the normal rate. And for kids, everything is very age dependent. And so for fetuses, what we typically think of as a normal heart rate is anywhere between, some people say 110 or 120 beats per minute to 180 beats per minute. Um, when we look at arrhythmias, we wanna think of sustained versus non-sustained, as well as irregular versus uh, regular. And so the subtypes we, and I kind of mentioned this at the beginning, we have irregular rhythms, bradyarrhythmias, and tachyarrhythmias. The incidence overall of all types of, of arrhythmias are about one to 2% of all pregnancies with the vast majority of them being uh, irregular transient arrhythmias. These are typically premature atrial complexes, which we'll talk about in a minute, but can also be transient sinus or brady, uh, bradycardia or tachycardia. Um, frequently, that's due to external factors like head compression, um, activity during labor, um, and or fetal distress for other non-cardiac reasons. The less commonly are these major arrhythmias, which we call uh, that are less than 10%, and most of 60% uh, of those major arrhythmias end up being sustained tachyarrhythmias. So when you know, you kind of know what you're getting for the most part when you start. The irregular rhythms, the vast majority of the rhythms that we see, uh, it's probably about 10 to 20% of all fetal referrals, um, it feels like, but one to 2% of all pregnancies are these irregular transient arrhythmias. It's most common in the third trimester, and, and most commonly the, are premature atrial complexes or contractions, though there are, can be premature ventricular contractions. These are less common, usually associated with things like myocarditis, long QT syndrome, or um, with other things going on. When we look at the Doppler patterns uh, for premature atrial complexes, because these are the most common things that we see, what we see is there's an ectopic focus um, or an ectopic beat that is initiated in the atrium. It, ha uh, it causes a depolarization that kind of beats out the sinus beat um, and heads to the AV node. And then there's two things that can happen. Um, the first thing is that that beat is, can be conducted by the AV node. And so you'll get a ventricular depolarization with that. And what you see on, uh, uh, pulse Doppler is that you see atrial beat. This is uh, just how this happens to be. This is 
a really small SVC Doppler. So you have your atrial beat, you have your ventricular depolarization as can be seen by an uh, aortic outflow Doppler. Um, but when you have that premature beat, it happens closer to the onset of the, uh, the closer to the ending of your systolic beat. But you have an early beat when you look kind of across the, the board, it comes early. And usually it has a smaller deflection than what you see in the previous two beats because there's been less filling time. So the kind of veracity of the beat is, is smaller. Um, the other thing that can happen when you have a premature complex, uh, atrial complex is that the beat comes so early, usually during systole or at the very, very end of systole, that, that beat, uh, the AV node is not ready to it, uh, accommodate that beat and it blocks that. So there's no ventricular depolarization there. And so what you see is almost a pause after, um, after with that uh, premature beat. And that can be seen by both 2D and M mode. You see the early deflection, the early beat, and then a pause in your ventricular beat as things reset. These are most often benign. Um, there is about a half to 1% risk of fetal tachyarrhythmias um, when you see frequent premature atrial complexes, but typically resolve after the um, first uh, couple of weeks after birth, and because some of the thought is that this is a mechanically induced process where um, the, there is some aneurysmal tissue of the foramen ovale that causes kind of a flicking motion against the free wall of the atrium. Bradyarrhythmias, these are sustained fetal heart rates of less than 110 beats per minute or at least a 10 minute period. And the most common types are sinus bradycardia, blocked premature atrial contractions, kind of like what we've talked about, but more regularly, so we call this atrial bigeminy, and then um, heart block. Um, I'll briefly mention sinus bradycardia. This is a slow sinus rate where you see one-to-one -one atrial ventricular conduction. You have a normal appearing Doppler. So everything looks normal. The heart rate is just low. Um, frequently, these are associated with fetal distress. So uh, can be an imminent sign of uh, oncoming uh, poor fetal outcome, but also can be associated with long QT syndrome. So if you see this um, in a baby um, that does well throughout pregnancy, uh, it's worthwhile getting an EKG after birth to look for at the QT interval because this can be, uh, is very well associated with this. And actually I had a patient recently where that was the only, um, that was, they were just bradycardic throughout pregnancy. And afterwards we found it had a significant, uh, long, significantly prolonged QT interval. Um, other bradyarrhythmias is blocked atrial bigeminy. This is frequent premature atrial complexes. Um, but the atrial rate in general is faster than the ventricular rate, but frequently you see kind of clumped beats together that, uh, that uh, kind of every other beat is non-conducted through the ventricle. So the heart rate appears slow, though there are twice as, uh, some frequently twice as many beats as the uh, atrial beats as ventricular. To differentiate it from heart block, there frequently can be inconsistency with that. You can go into sinus or see some conducted beats, um, but this is where we sometimes utilize other forms of um, uh, rhythm assessment to try and help us understand what's going on. From a 2D Doppler standpoint, this is a ductus venosus Doppler. Um, as you can see, they do a pulse Doppler in the abdomen, in the liver area. Um, this should be continuous, but what you see is a reversal here um, with atrial contraction. So you're getting reversal in the venous flow, causing um, kind of reverse flow into the, all the way into the ductus venosus. This is one of my, uh, again, a recent fetal patient. This is a pulmonary vein Doppler. Again, should be continuous anti-grade pulmonary venous uh, return. And what you see are these kind of two clumped together, um, at either going back to baseline or reversals, suggesting atrial contraction against um, a closed AV valve. And then here from M mode, I think actually you see it best. Um, and here you can see your four chamber view of the heart. You're going through, your M mode is going through the atria and the ventric, ventricle and, and the mitral valve here. What you see are two atrial contractions really back to back, but only one ventricular um, contraction here. So the first one is conducted, but that second one comes so quickly that there's no possible way for that ventricle to, con uh, to contract a uh, second time. I think this is just, I just love the Stoffler. It's nerdy, cool. Uh, look to it. Finally, from bradyarrhythmias, we talk about complete heart block. Um, this is abnormal conduction through the atrioventricular node, which is damaged um, there uh, or abnormal and or non-functioning. Um, the associations with this are with um, congenital heart disease, particularly congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries, um, as well as a heterotaxy sy uh, uh, syndrome and left atrial isomerism. 
Uh, more commonly with structurally normal hearts, we see this with maternal SSA and SSB antibodies or anti-Rho, anti-La anti antibodies. So moms that have lupus or Sjogren's syndrome, um, they have these antibodies that attack the conduction system. Um, and typically we see this between 18 and 28 weeks gestation. Uh, prophylactically, we as fetal cardiologists will assess these rhythms regularly in these moms, knowing that they're high risk, about 4% of developing heart block. Um, that's been decreased with some prophylactic treatment, but again, beyond the scope of this talk. The prognosis is there is when the baby does have complete heart block, there is a high association with high drops in mortality, particularly if they have heterotaxy or congenital heart disease associated with that. Um, and treatment, again, with antibodies, we can talk about dexamethasone, IVIG is recently been um, added to that and then prophylaxis with hydroxychloroquine. But those are, again, um, those are things we can do to possibly prevent progression of injury to the AV node, but um, again, beyond the scopes of this talk. When we look at the um, rhythm assessment, M mode is probably one of the more helpful because we're lo we look, can look at the rate of atrial contraction and then the rate of ventricular contraction. And we can see that it's complete dissociation. The atrial rate here in this one, and we can see that measurement here at up top, is 138, while the ventricular rate is 89. It's not, um, sometimes you can see two to one, and that can be um, suggestion of bi uh, atrial bigemony. Sometimes it can be hard to tell apart, or um, two to one heart block. Um, and when we look at uh, pulse Doppler, this is that pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein Doppler, you see kind of an irregular appearance to that phasic flow because the atria is contracting frequently against a closed AV valve, and so you get um, reversal or, or back to baseline flow or no flow into the atria during those times. Moving on to tachyarrhythmia is kind of our last topic here. This is sustained fetal heart rates over 180. There's sinus tachycardia, which is again, sinus rhythm that's fast. I won't delve into that too much, but we'll focus more on these last four, supraventricular tachycardia, atrial flutter, ventricular tachycardia, and then I'll mention junctional ectopic tachycardia, or persist persistent reciprocating junctional tachycardia, um, at the end. There is a risk of high drops when it comes to tachyarrhythmias, especially if sustained. This means sometimes frequently days in this arrhythmia before it's picked up. Um, and so that can cause high drops in poor systolic function. Um, and, but when uh, cardioverted it tends to have good outcomes. So Supraventricular tachycardia or reentrant tachycardia is one of the more common um, fetal tachy tachyarrhythmias that we see. It's probably two thirds of them. And they can have significantly rapid heart rates. So if you're seeing heart rates up to about 300 beats a minute, most commonly this is due to a reentrant tachyarrhythmia. Um, it has one to one conduction when looking on M mode and frequently has a very sudden onset and, uh, and um, offset. Um, in the uh, pictures here, these are pulse dopplers. These are um, aortic Dopplers as well as SVT Dopplers. The top one is in SV, uh, SVT. Um, you can see a very um, fast rate um, compared to our bottom, but you can also see um, when you kind of compare this as sinus on the, on the lower panel that you can see this SVC Doppler and how abnormal it looks with reversal at times um, with kind of retrograde atrial um, complexes, um, but you can see how abnormal those Dopplers look. Um, in addition, that rapid onset is frequently has a premature atrial complex as an initiating factor. So sometimes you'll see these kind of early PACs that go along um, that initiate into that rhythm. Most commonly, this is between 24 and 32 weeks. We can talk about treatment with sotalol or flecainide, um, but um, is usually well controlled and usually is not significantly persistent after birth. Next, we'll talk about atrial flutter. Although atrial flutter is not common in children, um, it is more common in fetuses. This is probably about 30% of the tachy uh, fetal tachycardias that we see, and it's an intraatrial reentrant circuit. Um, it is very, very fast atrial rates. It can be 300 to 500 beats per minute. So when you're looking at the cine clips of these babies, um, their atria looks like it's shivering, um, while the ventricle is, is beating uh, slower, but still pretty fast. Um, with atrial rates of 300 to 500, our average heart rates are somewhere between 180 to um, 250 beats a minute uh, from a ventricular standpoint. Um, and again, seen best by M mode. So what you see in M mode here, again, atrial wall is up top. You can see this just rapid, rapid um, contraction here. And then the ventricle here down low, you can see that there's two atrial beats for every ventricular contraction, suggesting that that's a two to one conduction 
Um, and since this rhythm is fast, it's unlikely something like blocked atrial bigeminy and is more likely atrial flutter. Uh, treatment, again, I say sotalol or digoxin. There's a lot of different treatment options there. Um, and again, this is another one that may be present at the time of delivery or shortly after delivery, but usually does not persist after. Much less common is ventricular tachycardia. This is uh, most commonly is it's very rare and is usually associated with things like um, tumors like rhabdomyomas, benign tumors, typically associated with tuberous sclerosis, ventricular aneurysms, so outpouchings of the ventricle that are congenital, myocarditis, and then long QT syndrome. Um, there is AV dissociation, so M mode is a really great way to look at this. Heart rates are typically somewhere over 180 to 400. So instead of having AV dissociation with a slow ventricular rate, this is AV dissociation with a fast ventricular rate. So you see rapid ventricular depolarizations or contractions with a much slower atrial rate. So this can be kind of intermittent. Um, this can be treated with maternal, maternal magnesium, sodalol, flecainide, propranolol. It really depends on what uh, the etiology is in terms of treatment factors um, and the persistence after delivery. Um, just like ventricular tachycardia in children and adults, it um, has a high incidence of high drops when sustained due to the kind of inefficiencies that occur when there is not AV concordance. And then finally, um, junctional topic tachycardia or persistent reciprocating um, junctional tachycardia or PJRT. It's a very rare heart rhythm and it can be really, really difficult. One of the more difficult rhythms to diagnose postnatally or prenatally, I mean. Um, and that's because the heart rates are um, generally slower, 160 to 210. So that can fall in a normal range, but it's uh, frequently persistent um, and non-variable. And that's one of your kind of clinical indications is most babies, their heart rates will vary just like normal people. And if it does not vary, or there's signs of high drops with a heart rate that's on the higher end of normal, um, that can be suggestive of this heart rhythm. Um, frequently with these, you get a depolarization at the junctional area. So you get kind of simultaneous ventricular and atrial depolarizations, um, and that can cause retrograde uh, flow um, in your venous dopplers because of uh, atrial contraction during closed, with a closed AV valve. Um, and so treatment is, again, treatment of the underlying condition and maternal antiarrhythmics. When we look at the Dopplers here, um, uh, this is a, um, I'm not sure if this is a IVC or a ductus venosus Doppler, but what you see is uh, a continuous kind of antegrade flow, but this very significant retrograde um, uh, flow uh, suspected during atrial conduction. And actually even into the umbilical Dopplers, you see your normal kind of uh, umbilical artery Doppler, but very phasic kind of flow during systole um, in the umbilical vein, suggesting that there's some abnormal um, atrioventricular uh, uh, process going on. So overall, these are kind of a primer on fetal arrhythmias and how we kind of use a back ways to, to assess these and, and a little bit about some of the arrhythmias that we see commonly. Um, and that is all I have from the lecture standpoint. And I think we're happy to talk about uh, more in depth or if anybody has questions out there. All right, and I can stop sharing. Thank you so much, Sarah. What a wonderful presentation. I feel like I've learned so much. Um, and I wanted to say thank you for, for sharing that excellent presentation. For those audience members that are logging in, I encourage you to have, if you have any questions, to please put them in the Q&A box below and we will uh, ask our uh, esteemed panel. Um, I'm very curious and I wanted to hear all your thoughts, but perhaps we can start with our expert tonight. Um, of all of the imaging modalities that we have in terms of echo with M mode and PW Doppler and tissue velocity imaging, which do you find most helpful when you're assessing a patient with foreign arrhythmia? Yeah, thank you. And Sarah, I uh, just want to commend you on a great overview of fetal arrhythmias and how we assess them. Uh, that was really nicely done. Um, the, in terms of how we assess rhythm, pulse wave Doppler is often where we start. As Sarah mentioned, really what we're looking at, we're not assessing, we're not able to assess the electrical um, pathway or conduction. We're looking at the mechanical activity and the timing of mechanical activity through the cardiac cycle. And so with pulse wave, what we're doing is looking at um, the uh, 
pattern, the flow patterns to assess when we're seeing ventricular and atrial um, contractions. And so that's usually where we start first uh, to, to look at the rhythm uh, and the rate um, to see whether it's a uh, tacky, brady, or irregular arrhythmia. And um, most commonly for me, that's where I'll start and in, in try to get assessment of atrial and ventricular contractions. Pulse, uh, I'm sorry, M mode can also be useful, particularly looking at the atrial, uh, the atrial rates. And Sarah had some really nice demonstrations of atrial flutter, where you can see that atrial rate maybe um, in the three or 400 range, as opposed to um, the a, a reentrant tachycardia, for example, where the atrial and ventricular rates will be the same. Um, in terms of uh, uh, tissue Doppler, as Sarah mentioned, is much more challenging to do in the fetus, and that's we, that's not part of our routine practice. Yeah, Sarah, thank you for that great overview. Um, I kind of cover all of that in thirty minutes. That was very, very impressive. Um, I agree. I think our mainstay for really understanding the rhythm and the abnormality is that pulse rate Doppler you can actually see as well. So nicely described the atrial contraction versus the particular opening for so trying to mimic all you know, P waves and MCRF. I find that for the new um, fetal sonographer or fellows and first year attendings who are still trying to figure these things out, I think the Doppler can sometimes be really challenging to, to look at that SPC and that inflow outflow. And for me, I always think of the M mode as sort of understanding the pattern. And so um, the end is really good at showing you the pattern of the atria and the ventricles. You can really count out your A's, count out your V's, figure out which one's going faster, and then try to figure out which one's going first or second. And then the nuances are really nicely demonstrated in the pulse wave where you see the contraction, you see the QRS, as we call it. Um, and then you can then take your arrhythmia, if it's tacky arrhythmia, for example, and we, when we get really fancy, we try to get long PRs versus long RTs to understand what kind of tacky arrhythmia it is. Um, and I, I just really want to highlight when we don't calculate an end mode, the value of slowing down your paper speed and speeding it up depending on what you're looking at. So if you want a pattern, you're going to slow down that paper speed and get a bunch in one frame so you can see what's really going on and how fast it's going and see how consistently it's happening. And then if you um, increase your paper speed, you might be able to separate the E's and A's or the um, SVC A or Doppler rules when it's going really fast. Yeah, I agree. When technique for M mode has been a learning process, I think realizing that getting good, um, you know, we use a lot of grayscale, but having really good contrast between your um, atrial cavity and then the walls. Um, or ventricular cavity in the walls has, is really helpful to kind of bring out those nice um, atrial and ventricular contractions and, and zooming in, which has been is uh, so that you have as you can maximize the amount of kind of uh, uh, deflection that you have. It really maximizes that too, and I think that is has been helpful. And mode we we don't use it much in, in transthoracic, and has been a, a has been a learning process. I think mode can be really challenging too, especially in a um, if there's not really great windows because of you need that contrast really to kind of see those deflections. Yes, Sarah, I think that's a great point that one of the one of the challenges with fetal echo is technical. So we're, we're looking obviously at a small heart and we're at a greater distance because we have to scan through the, the mother's abdomen to see that and depending on a number of factors including the maternal body habitus, the, uh, the amount of amniotic fluid, the gestational age of the baby, uh, and the baby's position. So whether we're having to look through the ribs or the spine, it can be a challenge. And, and to try to line up a good M mode where you see the, both the atrial wall and the ventricular wall, and you have good contrast uh, between the surrounding structures to really see that can be a challenge. I, and I find using color Doppler um, often jumps out even with a little bit more challenging imaging. The color Doppler can be a little bit easier to find the uh, structures you're looking for. One question I always 
um, have trouble with in my practice is, um, you know, we, as you, as you just demonstrated, it can be pretty complicated to get these images. And a lot of times when we see these things, we admit them into the MFM hospital, you know, the adult hospital with the MFM. Um, how do you work through the challenges of um, either assessing the rhythm in the hands of a sonographer who's not cardiac and feel cardiac trained or um, guiding them through that? Um, or are you just going over there, your institution to do that? What is the general practice that you see most commonly? You're asking in terms of working, you know, partnering with the MFMs to, to manage the diagnose and manage the rhythms. Um, I, I think that is a, a real challenge because we are relying on periodontologists to, to identify this or OBs to identify rhythm issues um, and working with uh, pediatric cardiologists who, who don't specialize in, in the maternal care. And then often if we decide that we need to continue to follow the baby or admit and treat, we need to, we're also treating the mother and, and there's some potential impacts um, on the mother with our treatment. And so it's really important to have close collaboration with the perinat perinatology team and often with the adult cardiology team as well. And in our hospital, if we do need to admit and treat, we often will involve the adult congenital team just because they're uh, commonly involved with managing women through pregnancy. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, often it does involve close collaboration. Our, we're fortunate that we have perinatologists in clinic with us. And so, when they have patients they're concerned about, we are sharing a workroom, and um, it is important to have communication, close communication for those patients. I work a lot at, at some of our outreach sites too, with more private, some of our private practice, so offsite MFMs, and and I think it's been, I, I sometimes get to go into their office, and so I can I can look at things, um, and I have access to their record system, so I at least can kind of look. But it's been talking to their sonographers, our OB sonographers, and saying, hey, these Dopplers are super helpful for us. So a lot of trying to get them to start doing some inflow outflow Dopplers, um, as well as doing good solid Dopplers with the ductus venosus and uh, umbilical artery, which can be, I think, really helpful. And then what we've seen in some of our MFM offices too is doing more cine clips because uh, OBs are notorious for doing a lot of still images. And so they've when they've had concerns, they'll get a couple cine clips um, for us as well that can sometimes just suggest, you know, when the heart rate looks abnormal. But I, I think that's been, it's always a challenge and, and it's really a teaching process, giving, uh, going out and giving lectures to sonographers, OB sonographers and, and MFMs and OBs. Um, and then I don't know if you guys have, we have an open kind of phone call, you know, call our office if you're worried about something. And I, you know, I can, I'm happy to look at it. And I think that access has been really successful for us and at least identifying things sometimes to my detriment. Now I've got like PACs coming out of my eyeballs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have a similar sort of open door policy that we, we suggest a fetal call system. So we actually have a fetal cardiologist on call. So every week one person is getting all these patients. And then we have the images um, pulled and we cover Alaska, Montana, a bunch of different places. So we have a way to get the images in. Um, and then our lead sonographer, M Mickey Klaus, um, actually made a YouTube video of the imaging and how to get an inflow and outflow and then how to measure that. And so that's how we sort of tried to teach the sonographers in the region um, how to do that. Obviously, at the hospital across the street, we can just walk over there um, and we do in person training for the sonographers that are in that people. Correct. When we're in the region and you just want to help out, um, it's a challenge. Um, we're, we're getting creative. One follow-up I had since it's sort of in line with what we're talking about is um, how do you decide when to follow and how often to follow versus when to admit uh, to the hospital based on your imaging? Um, how often do you perform echoes? I know we sometimes talk about you know tachyarrhythmias and how often they're doing it, um, as well as bradyarrhythmias and when it's too late to treat. So um, just I know it's a, a long-winded question, but how, how do you make that decision and how often do you follow? 
So um, maybe starting with the tachyarrhythmias, in general, in terms of initiating treatment, there are a couple of indications to initiate treatment. First and foremost, if there's high drops and, and we feel like that's related to a tachyarrhythmia, then that's certainly an indication to initiate treatment. And so those women would be admitted and monitored and treatment would be started. Um, in the absence of high drops, in the fetus that's been in a tachyarrhythmia, particularly a fast tachyarrhythmia, so well above 200 for a significant period of time, they may start to demonstrate evidence of heart failure and maybe not yet high drops. So they may, may have AV valve regurgitation, there may be diminished ventricular function. And those would be indications as well that the child is not tolerating the tachyarrhythmia well and needs management to try to, to convert to a sinus rhythm. Um, in instances where it's being well tolerated, so there's no high drops, the ventricular function is good, so there's no AV valve regurgitation. In, in those babies, then there is the luxury of observing them. Often we will admit to monitor. And so if over a 24 hour period of time, the baby is in tachycardia for less than 50%, so less than 12 hours at that time, then we, that, that is, doesn't often progress to a more sustained tachycardia. It's much less likely to develop high drops. And so that's a child that we may elect to continue to monitor as an outpatient and without initiating treatment. And in that case, we want to keep a close eye on the baby to make sure that there isn't a change, that they do have good ventricular function, that, um, and again, no evidence of high drops. And so we may have them seen at least two to three times a week, either by the cardiologist or the perinatologist to, to assess for those issues. Um, if they are in tachycardia, and particularly with the reentering tachycardia, they may go in and out of the tachycardia through the course of the day, and it appears that they're in that more than 50% of the time, then usually we will uh, start treatment at that point. Um, in terms of bradycardias, uh, that, that can be more challenging in the, the management of that. We don't have a good way medically to, um, to increase the heart rate. Obviously, the, the treatment for bradycardia would be to, to try to pace them, and we don't have that uh, luxury in utero. But if there's a process that we might be able to reverse, and specifically thinking about um, antibody mediated from maternal lupus, there, the management of that is, is challenging and there's not clear data. Typically with first or second degree heart block, particularly if there's ventricular dysfunction, we may treat with, uh, with steroids to try to um, mitigate the antibody mediated injury to the myocardium and um, but the, the, the data on that is, uh, it, that's a, a controversial topic within the field. And as Sarah alluded to, IVIG is another consideration um, as well. I think I would just add to that, that the gestational age makes a big difference about the management as well, right? We know that if, if the baby's 34, 35 weeks, initiating therapy for mom may be harder and fraught with more complications than delivering the baby who will very likely do well, have good outcomes, and some may be even able to go to the you know newborn nursery or have a very short NICU stay. And so I, I think there's a lot of it that depends on the timing and, and the control of the, of the arrhythmia that sometimes delivery and the process of delivery um, can just be beneficial to to either cardiovert on the outside, which is a lot easier uh, than, than trying to medically manage while a baby through mom. And so I, I think we were consistently weighing the risks benefits for both tachy frequently, but also bradyarrhythmias on, on when do we bring that baby out, knowing that, especially for bradyarrhythmias, having the size is going to be important, especially if they have signs of distress and need pacemaker and, and pacing after birth. Everyone touched uh, very elegantly on the natural history, uh, or at least talked about, you know, the fear. Um, but you know, I was wondering, how do these arrhythmias 
translate post delivery? Um, what are what are some of the things that you've seen in a baby that had a lot of arrhythmias in utero and when they're delivered? Um, yeah, that's a that's a great question, and and um, I think is particularly relevant to, to what Sarah was just talking about in terms of the decision, do we deliver, do we manage this um, uh, after delivery or do we try to manage through the pregnancy? Um, and so in terms of atrial flutter, uh, once very often once you convert that, it won't come back. And, um, and postnatally, it's pretty unusual for atrial flutter to recur. And so the key is to to cardiovert and then keep a close eye. Often we we might continue treatment through if we if we cardiovert cardiovert in utero, um, treat for a period of time and then come off medication. Um, in, in terms of SVT, I'm sorry. In terms of atrial flutter, I mean I'm sorry. Yes, uh, reentry tachycardia. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. In terms of reentry tachycardias, those may recur, and so. Those we often will, um, depends on how sick the baby is, how fast the tachycardia is, there, there may be some factors that influence, but uh, we will monitor and often treat them for a period of time, particularly if there's recurrence postnatally, but that's much more common to recur. From brainy arrhythmias, heart block in particular, that is because it's kind of permanent uh, damage to the AV node, that is, is fraught with being a more permanent uh, option, uh, you know, doesn't kind of get better. What we do see is that anybody, any mom, where she has those antibodies that are at risk, that baby, even if there was never slow heart rates that we would get an EKG after birth because uh, first degree heart block, although we can measure that mechanical PR interval um, prenatally is, is not perfect. So we would, we would look for signs of early heart block. Um, with congenital heart disease, uh, that heart block really uh, can can lead to poor out, uh, kind of as an indicator of maybe of poor outcomes, but um, is again a permanent process. Now, not every baby with, especially with structurally normal heart and complete heart block, need a pacemaker right away. Um, most of them will need a pacemaker by the time that they're probably 10 years old, but but it is something that we can watch and and can be a very minimal intervention early on but just something that that's watched closely. So uh, if they have a narrow QRS and good function after birth, that, that can be something that, that kids live with and, and do well with for, for a long time. Um, some of the more uncommon arrhythmias like ventricular tachycardia and things, it really depends on the etiology. Um, rhabdomyomas, uh, kind of benign tumors that are found in the, in the ventricles or, or um, uh, aneurysms uh, can have more persistent ventricular arrhythmias after birth. And that can actually be an indication, particularly for those with significant ventricular aneurysms that um, can lead to poor function and actually need for transplant and other kind of secondary interventions because of how significant those arrhythmias are postnatally. Yeah, and I'll just add a couple more comments. One being, um, as David and Ted have already been alluding to, it's really, it's really an art trying to figure out what to do prenatally for these families, because when you look at the doses of medications we give to the mom to get through the placenta, um, you know, we're looking at these echoes, not an EKG, and you really have to make decisions knowing that mom needs to be monitored on telemetry and is at risk for um, arrhythmias when we use these medications, which is flecanide, sodalol, uh, really, and first to Jackson. And then after the baby's born, um, there's a washout period, and that's why what David is saying about how we sometimes keep these kids on medications for a few months. You can either let some of them wash out quickly, some of them don't, and so um, part of it's just um, babies don't tell us that they're in a, in a heart rhythm problem, and so it's nice to just have that buffer, but also that they're washing out from the maternal medications for a few days, and so some, sometimes we have to keep them in the hospital and turn them on the head and the heat. Um, the other thing natural history-wise is we learn so much from our fetuses. So sometimes moms don't even know they're antibody positive or they don't know they have a long QT or the dad doesn't know he has long QT until we find a fetus with an arrhythmia. So um, the natural history can sometimes change for the entire family and particular pregnancies from what we find. Um, 
So I have one more. Oh, go ahead. oh no, I was going to say, and I forgot to mention those, the most common arrhythmia that we see, those premature uh, atrial complexes, the isolated ones, those, a lot of it is thought to be mechanical. Um, the atrial septum, you have your foramen ovale, you have your flap of tissue that kind of comes off and that's bowing into the left atrium and, and it can be quite billowy. We call it an aneurysm, which is probably the scariest thing we could ever tell a parent. Um, but that we think, especially near the pulmonary vein entrances, we know that that's an area where you can have a nidus for, for early beats. And so once that your left atrial pressure increases and your right atrial pressure decreases after birth, that flap of kind of billowy tissue that might be causing these premature beats kind of closes up. Um, and, and so those are typically resolving by two weeks after, um, after birth. And so those really don't have much in the way of long-term consequences. It, it's fairly uncommon for those to have um, long-term problems. Even those blocked atrial bigeminy typically get better at, at times after, after delivery. So that, those are the most reassuring and nice ones to, to have. Yeah, I've moved from calling it an aneurysm to redundant just because it does make so many people <laughs> Um, Since we have the Wisconsin crew on here, I have to ask one last question. I know it's not technically an imaging modality, but it really is because it uses the magnet. Um, fetal magnetocardiography seems to be um, a promising way to really look at the rhythm of these babies in the fetus um, the way that we would like to with the actual P, QRS, and T wave. I have tried to use a fetal heart rate monitor to extract EKG in the fetus, and we know how hard that is. It's just not, not coming anytime soon. But I would love to hear um, the utility of fetal magnetocardiography in these last you know, three to four minutes um, and how often you use it. Um, and what things you think it's best for um, as we think about referring to you for our purposes? Yeah, we are really lucky in that we have um, right down the road, one of our partners, Jeanette Strasberger, uh, has uh, done a lot of research in developing fetal magnetic cardiography, which is a way of looking at the magnetic signals generated from the or magnetic fields generated from the electrical signal in the fetal heart, and then uh, using complex algorithms, um, subtracting out the um, uh, maternal signals and to generate really what ends up being a rhythm strip, uh, really a, a EKG rhythm strip of the fetus. And um, it is, separate from, I guess, in some ways from, from echo and imaging, but, but they do use echo to guide and, and as they, they take the, uh, take the pictures. But for us, it's, it's a great adjunct to what we do. And often it can add information in terms of being able to see, um, the, the more clearly delineate the rhythm. So looking at short uh, RP versus long RP rhythms, um, we can see at times um, Jeanette is able to tease out if there are ST changes when babies are in high drops and stressed out. Um, and also we've had, um, we've had babies come in with sinus bradycardia and sent them over. And as Sarah was talking about, um, um, we can uh, look and see the the baby's rhythm, and that may impact how we talk to the family as well and, and screening for the rest of the family as well. Um, and then there are times that it, Sarah showed a uh, rhythm strip of a baby in junctional ectopic tachycardia, and we were suspicious of that from, from the rhythm strips, that it might be either a ventricular tachycardia or junctional ectopic tachycardia. Um, and if you recall, there it was an umbilical artery Doppler tracing. You could see the umbilical artery tracing. And then below it, the venous uh, pattern showed that there was a um, there was a uh, atrial contraction or deflection right in the middle of ventricular systole, and this is in a baby that had high drops and wasn't a clear uh, arrhythmia in the sense that the heart rate was about 160, 170, wasn't significantly fast. But given that abnormal Doppler, we ended up sending the uh, the mother to get an FMCG, we were able to de determine that it did have uh, junctional like tach tachycardia and initiated treatment. The, the rhythm normalized, the high drops resolved, and the baby did well. I think Dr. Strasberger has been lovely as a junior faculty to have as a, as a resource. 
um, kind of for all things rhythm issue, but, and I, she would probably tell you, she would scan anybody. Uh, she would, she loves getting those in, but I think for me, it's when, it's when you're not, you know, a lot of what we do is, is supposition. And so I've had a, a several patients with bradyarrhythmias that I, it, it's hard sometimes to tease out as you know, um, and, and you're nervous about missing something that's, that's important. And so in addition to, you know, things, um, blocked atrial by Gemini is, is one of those things that I can think is really hard to disseminate or discriminate sometimes without good, uh, if you, especially if you don't have good M mode imaging, um, from, from heart block or even two to one heart block. And so, um, I find that those Brady arrhythmias and helping to decide, is this, is this blocked? You know, if you're not quite sure it's, it's nice to have that ability to, to send, um, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into it too. She, you know, there's, there's limitations to that. And so having the right patient at the right time is, is helpful as well. And I believe she's also doing a lot of research now too, and looking at families where there is a history of, of, a sudden fetal, you know, sudden fetal death or a, or a late miscarriage or something like that. And looking at, are there risk factors that we didn't know about long QT or other things, um, uh, that we could potentially diagnose early in, in a fetus, um, because of things like torsad de you know, towards sides of plan and all of that kind of stuff. So, uh, I think, I think again, we are, we are lucky in, in Wisconsin to have her, uh, for as long as she wants to be doing this. And this was an excellent, uh, discussion. I wanted to thank you all for participating today. Uh, I really learned a lot. Um, and I really appreciate a wonderful presentation and excellent discussion. Um, I wanted to also say that uh, in terms of the ASC3 lecture series, we're going to be taking a short break, but we'll be back in the new year. Uh, if you are interested in participating in the lecture series or have ideas for lecture topics, uh, please keep a lookout for a survey that's going to be sent to the E3 members. And if you would like to join E3, log into your ASC account under update my profile, click on specialty interest groups, and then E3. Thank you all for joining in and happy holidays to you all. Take care. I think we're done. Right. Thank you guys so much Thank for this. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Great job, Sarah, as Thanks. always. Have a good night. Might Bye. see you tomorrow, David. Bye.